Hello, this is part four of a series on the Levites. Uh, before we carry on with our study, we have to take a quick look at the empires of Mesopotamia during this time. Now, the, the part that we are studying here, if you look at this chart, at the very top line, the biblical time, uh, you'll see the first temple and the second temple of ancient Israel. And the part that we are studying now is between the two temples. In part two, we ended it with the destruction of Jerusalem by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, in 586 BC. Now, the Babylonian Empire was a pretty short-lived empire. It, it only lasted about 87 years. The Assyrian Empire, which was the first of the great empires of the Middle East, it went on for about 134 years. The Assyrians, they were the first great, great empire, which means an, a kingdom that rules over other kingdoms and absorbs them all into its government. The Assyrians were very much hated by everybody because they were very cruel dictators and they ruled with fear and cruelty. And the nations that surrounded them couldn't wait to get rid of them for the most part. So eventually it was inevitable that all the enemies would gather together against Assyria. The Medes or the Median Empire to the north of Assyria, the, the Medes kingdom, it formed out of a loose coalition of enemies who were fighting against Assyria. These people were um, a lot of Indo-Europeans that had been migrating in for, from the north and they are also known as Scythians and Cimmerians. They were basically Indo-European tribes that were migrating down and settling to the north of Assyria. And the Assyrians were constantly trying to take over that area and rule over them. And the more they fought against them and tried to take over them, the more they united them. And they were up on a mountain range, so it was harder to conquer. And these people, the, the land was a natural fortification in a lot of areas. So they naturally um, were able to fight back for the most part. And the more they had to fight, the more they were united. And it eventually united into a coalition of people known as the Medes. And they were just the whole area north of Assyria. And Assyria, in the later part of the empire, had destroyed the kingdom of Elam. They destroyed their capital city of Susa. And that area became another confederation known as Persia. And these were the enemies who were gathering against Assyria. And Babylon had always had a spirit of independence. The uh, Assyrian kings all often put a king or a governor in Babylon, and the Assyrian king was often known as the king of two kingdoms, Assyria and Babylon. So they they constantly tried to appease the national spirit of Babylon, and but it never died. It was a constant thing because they were an older kingdom. Babylon eventually gained independence from Assyria by a king named Nabopolassar. And he was originally a king of the sea people which is in the marshlands of, of the Persian Gulf. And he 
eventually moved in and became the king of Babylon. And, and he, he took that from Assyria and, gained, and Babylon gained independence. And they were somewhat loosely became allies at first, but then Babylon joined with the Persians and the Medes and they all attacked Assyria together. And that led to the destruction of Assyria and the end of the empire. And the Medes and the Persians to the north basically became two kingdoms who were very much allied with each other because they had common roots. They uh, had uh, Aryan roots, they called themselves. And Babylon basically filled the vacuum that was left by the Assyrian Empire. And Babylon ended up controlling the whole, what used to be Assyria, from all the way from Egypt and all the way up into Mesopotamia. The Babylon Empire lasted for only about 87 years. And it fell to the Persians. Now, the way the, the Persian Empire became strong was it was always Persia was, was ruled over by the Medes. And there was a Persian king who, who was a governor of Persia. He was part of the royal family. His name was Cyrus. And he rose up. And he was a very um, merciful and likable king. And his judgment was that what Assyria had, and Babylon had always done was to keep people out of their homelands and put other people in those lands and move people around to keep them all in a state of confusion and in a state of slavery and they ruled over them with fear well cyrus his philosophy was to support their the different cultures in the different areas and support the different religions and to allow people to go back to their homelands and he was very much liked by the people he ruled over and for that reason, he became very great very quickly. And he also had battles with kings. But this is one of the reasons that he became so quickly a, a leader of such a great empire. Now, Cyrus started as a Persian king, but very quickly became a ruler over Medes as well and joined the Medes and the Persians into one kingdom, which we call Medo-Persia. This is the beginning of the Persian Empire. And the, under Cyrus, he conquered Babylon. So when he conquered Babylon, then he automatically filled the vacuum that was left by Babylon. And his next step was moving into Egypt and in, into all the lands that used to be controlled by Babylon. Uh, now part of that, so in our timeline of history here, we see the Persian Empire starting in 539. Well, 539 is the end of the Babylonian Empire. The Persian Empire, it kind of started a little bit before that. And 539 was when they conquered Babylon. So if we look at this chart here, this is a chart of the Persian kings. In the blue part above, that was the Medes who were the rulers. And then Cyrus the second from 550 to 530, that's Cyrus the Great. He's the one who, who uh, the Persian who took over the Medes. 
Now, Cyrus the Great, this is where we begin our study. In the book of Ezra, the very first thing we read, chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> now, the first, so Cyrus the Great conquers Babylon, and he... Um, now, what they'll call the first year of Cyrus would be the first year that Cyrus ruled over Babylon, I suppose. Because he wouldn't have been able to make this edict until he had conquered Babylon. So this is the exiles returning back from captivity in Babylon back to rebuild Jerusalem. And it begins with the book of Ezra. So in chapter 1, verse 1, I'll just read quickly about Cyrus. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. That was the 70 year prophecy that they would return after 70 years. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So what does Cyrus mean by this? He has charged me to build him a house? If we look at Isaiah chapter 45, this is about 200 years before Cyrus was even born. Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have hold, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places, that thou may know that I... The Lord which call thee by thy name am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else, and there is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me, I am the Lord and there is none else. And he goes on and on, okay? Um, so Cyrus, in, in Ezra chapter 1, is saying God has called me to build his kingdom and to, to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. He's, he's referring to the prophet Isaiah who called him by his name. And who was in Babylon in the royal house as a, an advisor to the king when Cyrus conquered Babylon? Daniel, the prophet Daniel. So he likely could have showed Cyrus this prophecy. I, it, there's no where it's written, but Daniel was in, the, in, in Babylon when it was conquered by Cyrus. And Daniel remained in the office of advisor, magician, astrologer, prophet in the, in the kingdom, into the Persian kingdom. Cyrus goes on to say, who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whoever remains in any place where he sojourns, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. 
Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised, to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So Cyrus made this proclamation to go build the house in Jerusalem. Um, now, we must understand, for one thing, that not all of the Jews left Babylon. Um, it was only a small remnant of them that went back, that took up this task, and that wanted to go back to Jerusalem. I guess many of the Jews, they have built a community of their own in Babylon and in the lands of the kingdom. And over the 70 years or so that they have been there, they, they had children there, they had wives and husbands there, and they just decided to stay. They, they were happy with where they were. But there was a small percentage that went back to rebuild the ruins of Jerusalem. <clears throat> And that, that, that community in Babylon, which ended up in modern times being Iraq, that community remained there right up until 1948, the Yom Kippur War, when the Jews were expelled from all the Arab countries. That was when that community finally ended in that area. It, it was there the whole time from 586 BC until 1948 AD. Now, when Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon, he set Darius I as a governor in Babylon. So he, Darius I is also known as Darius the Mede. And he's the, the one on the, on the chart here that from 522 to 486, he ended up becoming the Persian king. But from the fall of Babylon in 539, Darius was the governor in Babylon. And Cyrus, he put his, he left his son, Cambyses II, he left him in charge of the kingdom in, of Persia, basically, while Cyrus spent a lot of time off fighting battles and wars and conquering other kingdoms. Cambyses II was on the throne. And Darius I was the governor or king in Babylon, in the city of Babylon. And Cambyses was in Susa, I suppose. The, Susa was, was the capital city in Mesopotamia of the Elamites. The Elamite empire was destroyed by Assyria and the kingdom of Susa was destroyed near the end of the um, Assyrian Empire, but it was rebuilt again. And it, it became a, a capital city of the Persians. Then when the Jews gather around in Jerusalem, all the ones that had listened to the decree and, and came to Jerusalem, they started to gather and to figure out what's going on. Um, some of the priests were polluted, seed because they could not be identified among the records of genealogy that were kept. And they were commanded not to eat of the most holy things until a high priest could stand to judge what, what they should do. And they began to dwell in the cities and the towns around Jerusalem. And in the seventh month there came the Feast of Tabernacles which was one of the high holy days um, uh, identified by Moses. And all the people gathered in Jerusalem, according to the custom. 
And the two leaders there were called Zerubbabel and Jeshua. Zerubbabel, his name means descended of Babylon or descendant of Babylon. And he was the governor of Jerusalem. And Jeshua, as we know, his name is the same name as Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus. It's the same name. So Jesus was the high priest. Okay. Now, but in this book it's called Yeshua, which distinguishes him from Joshua or Jesus or Yeshua. Okay, so, so they set up the altar first on, this, on the foundation and um, according to the law of Moses, they, they uh, offered offerings and then they hired carpenters and masons from Tyre and Sidon to bring cedars from Lebanon and to start rebuilding the temple because Cyrus had provided them with the money and the, the materials and everything they needed to do this. And in the second year, the work began and the priests were assembled from 20 years old up to do the work and the foundation was completed and the sons of Asaph, remember they were the Levite musicians for the temple, they were assembled to sing the praises of the Lord. They sang, For his mercy endureth forever, after the ordinance of King David of Israel. All right, in Ezra chapter 4, these people that were in the land came to Zerubbabel and Jeshua, and they offered to help to build. But the Jews refused their help and said, no, we are the only ones who can build this temple to the Lord because it had to be Levites to do the work and they didn't want strangers coming and being involved. And so from that time on, they started to harass them and to try to stop them. And eventually, it says in verse Ezra chapter 4, Verse 5, it says, And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So if we look at this chart, we'll see that um, Cyrus II, he was the first king of Medo-Persia, Cyrus the Great. And... Darius was not his son. Darius was his son-in-law. He was like a general in his army that he put in charge of Babylon. And when Cyrus's son, Cambyses, Cambyses he ruled for about eight years after Cyrus, but he killed his brother and a bunch of stuff happened and there was an imposter that killed him that took the throne that pretended to be his brother. Um, but that imposter was exposed and routed out by Darius. So Darius ended up becoming the king of Medo-Persia um, and Cyrus's family was basically gone except Darius was his son-in-law so the Darius continued the royal blood bloodline from there so this harassment they say was done by Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes well the way things worked in these days was when Cyrus was the king, he was off fighting wars and he left his son on the throne in the palace. And Darius did the same thing. When Darius was out fighting wars, he left his son and grandson in the palace. And his son and grandson were involved with uh, stopping the work on the temple. 
because of these people wrote them letters and said, uh, oh, the Jews are only rebuilding Jerusalem so that they can rebel against you. Because if you look into the records from Babylon, you will see that all they do is rebel. And so the grandson of Darius looked into the records and he sent an edict to stop the work. So I suppose Darius must have been off. He would go off for years into different battles. And so this is what happened. Okay, so, so this complaint that they lodged worked. And it was the son of Darius, Ahusarus, who stopped the work. And then um, God sent two prophets to the Jews to encourage them to continue the work. And those two prophets were named Haggai and Zechariah. And we have the writings that they are two minor prophets in the Old Testament from those two prophets. Haggai is a very short book. There's not a lot to it. Um, in this Bible, it's not even two pages long. It's uh, comprised of two chapters. And it starts in the second year of Darius, king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month came to the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, the high priest. So he's prophesying to Jeshua, Jesus, or Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time is not yet come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe, but there is none warm. And he that earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag full of holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew upon it. Why, says the Lord, because of my house that is waste, and you run every man to his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and the new wine. So he's basically telling them, you know, you have to build the house, and I will bless you. And then they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai, and then Haggai began to speak on the Lord's behalf, saying to the people, I am with you. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. And in the seventh month came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory, and how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, and be strong, O Joshua, the high priest, and be strong, all you people, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Fear not. For thus says the Lord, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, 
and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this later house shall be greater than that of the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And he's, this, this is alluding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The glory will be greater than the old temple, and in this place I will give peace. This is how a Christian reads it. And in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai. So this is in the first and second year of Darius, king of Persia, that Haggai is speaking as a prophet. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride them. Excuse the noise, that's the people cutting the grass out there. And I will overthrow the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, says the Lord, and I will make you as a signet, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. So this is the prophet Haggai. He came and he's telling them, build anyway. Don't listen to the stuff, just keep building. And so they did. And I think this will be a good time to end part four. And we'll carry on in part five from here. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe if you like the videos. And we will see you again.